Today, I'm going to be talking about advances in minimal residual disease uh, in acute myeloid leukemia as MRD testing has become a very crucial part of the modern treatment for acute leukemia. I have no conflict of interest to disclose related to this talk. <clears throat> During my talk today, I will start with the concept of MRD in AML, then I will spend most of the time on the different methods of MRD testing and the clinical significance of MRD in the prognosis and treatment of AML. Then lastly, I will discuss some practical issues associated with current MRD testing at present. So uh, concept of MRD in AML. A normal hematopoiesis starts with a hematopoietic stem cell, which give rise to a lymphoid progenitor and a myeloid progenitor. And lymphoid progenitor further differentiates into, <coughs> sorry, T cells and B cells, and the myeloid progenitor differentiates into mature neutrophils and other mature forms of white blood cells. AML is caused by clonal proliferation of progenitor cells with reduced capacity to differentiate into more mature forms. How do we make a diagnosis of AML? Current WHO defines more than 20% myeloid blast or blast equivalent in peripheral blood or bone marrow, or myeloid sarcoma formation, which means there is a soft tissue mass conformed of myeloid blasts. AML primarily affects older adults and is more prevalent in patients older than 60 years old. It is a bad disease. Outcomes actually have not substantially improved in the last four decades. This is the curve for five year relatively survival. And as you can see here, in patients older than 65 years old, merely five to 10% would be alive five years after initial diagnosis. And considering the average life expectancy at age 65 approached 20 years, and still more than five years at age of 85, the AML attributable years of loss are enormous. It's a bad disease, and how do we treat AML? The first line treatments, including several rounds of induction therapy, followed by several rounds of consolidation chemotherapy. After that, depending on the outcomes of these therapies, and patient's risk factors. Patients can either be removed from therapy or offer further consolidation or auto-transplant, or if patient had bad disease and poor uh, response, they could be offered allo-transplant. How do we assess a treatment response? That's the big question. The initial goal of induction therapy is to achieve complete remission. For many years, CR is a gold standard for therapeutic success in AML. In the National Working Group in 2003, defines morphologic CR as less than 5% blast in the bone marrow, with no blast with R rods, no persistent actual medullary disease, and patients should have um, some degree of peripheral count recovery, neutrophil greater than 1,000, and plate over 100,000 patient should remain transfusion independent. And there's um, cytogenetic uh, remission and also molecular remission if the patient disease has specific cytogenetic abnormalities. However, not all AML has cytogenetic um, abnormality, so molecular CR still is the golden standard for all AML. Morphologic CR is now sufficient for a cure. As you can see, 50 to 80% of patients achieve CR. However, most patients relapse within three to five years from diagnosis. So the major obstacle to cure disease is disease recurrence. This AL15 study, including more than 3,000 patients, is in younger patients. And you can see no matter what the initial induction therapy is, 40 to 50% of patients relapse. So apparently, morphologic CR is not a good predictor for relapse. We do want to identify prognostic factors that can accurately predict relapse. So we can give additional therapy for only those patients who will relapse and avoid unnecessary therapy on patients who will not relapse. For many years, risk stratification is based on pretreatment variables, that including a list of patient and disease-related factors age, performance status, WBC, 
uh, de novo versus secondary, uh, even cytogenetics and molecular markers group into favorable, intermediate, and adverse outcome. Sorry, keep coming back. Using errors under receiver operation curves to quantify the predictive ability of this variable for treatment resistance, based on the data of 4,500 younger and older patients with newly diagnosed AML, if we're only including this basic factor, the AUC, the predicted value, is only 0.64. Even when you include the cytogenetic factors, you increase AUC to only 0.78, which was only intermediate between a coin flip AUC 0.5 and certainty AUC 1.0. So apparently, these pretreatment factors do not provide adequate predicted value for outcome. Overall, the source of relapse is the persistent leukemic blast in the body. Uh, the concept MRD described residual disease detected by lab techniques more sensitive than, flows, uh, than morphology. It is a post-treatment variable. The concept is built on the principle that the likelihood of disease recurrence is related to the amount of residual leukemic blast. For example, for patients with persistent disease, the blast can be easily detected by morphologic assessment. In the patients with higher level of MRD, they have higher rates of relapse than those with lower level of MRD. So if the patients have lower level of MRD, could only be detected by more sensitive methods. Theoretically, if the patients do not have um, detectable residual disease, <coughs> they shouldn't experience uh, relapse. However, no matter how sensitive or how improvement the sensitivity of a current assay is, still significant amount of le residual leukemic blast cannot be detected, causing the relapse in MRD-negative patients. What is the rationale for MRD assessment? We think MRD represents the integration of both the biologic characteristic of leukemic cells and patient-related intrinsic variation, including drug metabolism and host um, response which together determine a patient's response to therapy. So there is a strong rationale to incorporate MRD status into the criteria to, for CR to define an immunologic or molecular remission, which could be more predictive outcome. That's the concept of MRD, why we're doing MRD testing. Then how we detect MRD in AML. MRD assessment really evolved over the past four decades. Um, in 1980s, the earliest study of MRD is the immunofluorescence microscopy to look for surface and cytoplasmic proteins. It's already a hundred times, a thousand times more sensitive than traditional morphologic counting. Then in 1990s, newer methods for MRD detection developed, including PCR and uh, flow cytometry. Uh, in 2000, MRD technology was further refined with improvement to existing approaches and addition of newer technology like NGS. Now the sensitivity can reach up to one to a million cells. The difference between the traditional assessment of MRD and the current technology is like the difference between a classic detective and a modern crime scene investigator. So these are the major methods for MRD detection. Chromosome analysis and the FISH are well standardized, but they're only applicable to a subset of leukemia with cytogenetic abnormalities. And sensitivity is relatively low, ranging from 0.5 to 5%. Today, I'm going to focus on the more sensitive methods, flow cytometry, RT-PCR, and the next generation sequencing. Each has its advantage and a disadvantage. Flow cytometric detection of MRD relies on the immunophenotypic principle that leukemic cells show altered pattern of antigen expression. This principle is implemented into two related approaches for MRD detection. Identify leukemic associated immunophenotype, LAIPs, and the difference from normal approach. And the best strategy is combine the two to some extent in actual practice. And the flow detection of MRD is reported to be informative in about 90% of cases in most studies, using more than six colors. And in our laboratory, we use a 10-color flow cytometer 
Um, and we were able to define abnormal immunophenotype in almost all cases of AML using a difference from normal approach. This is the outline of antibody groups um, used in flow cytometry for AML diagnosis and subsequent MRD testing. It is composed of core markers to identify BLAST in combination with lymphoid markers and myelomonocytic markers to evaluate maturation. A stem cell combination may be included to detect potential immunophenotypic um, aberrancies in leukemic stem cells. And aberrant immunophenotype includes marker underexpression, overexpression, and asynchronous maturation of the BLAST population, cross lineage expression, the BLAST is myeloid but they express lymphoid markers, and asynchronous maturation of the myelomonocytic maturation. Most of flow cytometry MRD assay design is based on this um, panel and antibody combination. How do we use um, LAIP approach? This is example to identify LAIP, which is a combination of antigens expressed on the leukemic blast. A diagnosis, an antibody panel is used to define regions that contain only leukemic blast. For example, in this case, the informative antibodies are CD45, 33, 7, 15, and 34 and you see BLAST in these predefined regions. And after therapy, the informative antibody, which including the antibody I just mentioned, is used to identify the leukemic BLAST in the predefined regions. I hope you can see some red dots in every of these um, predefined regions, and MRD is positive in this case at 0.004%. And the list of LRP is extensive. While this strategy has been successfully used in some studies, it has some limitations. First, the immunophenotype of the leukemic blast are not always stable, especially under the influence of therapy. And it's been reported 90% would have immunophenotypic changes in at least one antigen between relapse and diagnosis. And second, due to the leukemic blast heterogeneity, it's possible that dominant clone may disappear after therapy while a minor clone dominates, which causing the false negative results. And it's been reported population changes actually occurred in 31% of cases at relapse, at relapse compared to diagnosis. And thirdly, this approach is completely dependent on knowing the diagnostic immunophenotype. Without a diagnostic immunophenotype, LAIPs cannot be defined and regions cannot be constructed. So to avoid this limitation, Dr. Brandwood introduced the approach difference from normal, which recognized immunophenotypic deviations of leukemic blast from normal progenitors. I'm showing you one example of the normal maturation pattern. The orange population in the upper panel represents early stem cells, and on the lower panel represents early promyelocytes, which is one step differentiated from stem cells. And as you can see, during the differentiation from stem cells to promyelocytes, the cells lose CD34, gain CD38, gain 15, gain 13, and gain DR. I'm only showing you five antibodies here, but our um, assay including um, 18 antibodies. So we looked at all these antibodies and evaluate the pattern of maturation. This is an example. Upper panel is the sample in remission and the red population is stem cells and I'm showing you the normal maturation pattern with lose 34, gain 38, gain 15. And in the lower panel, you can easily recognize this orange population sits outside of the normal maturation pathway. And compared to the normal progenitors, they have expression of CD5, increase 13, increase 34, and CD38. So through this approach, we can easily identify this population is not normal. We don't care what is original immunophenotype is, is currently abnormal compared to the normal progenitor. Compared with LAIP, difference from normal avoids limitation caused by immunophenotypic changes because we not only look one or two antigens, we look at the entire maturation pathway. So in majority of cases, we can identify abnormal blast even after significant immunophenotypic changes. Secondly, it does not rely on diagnostic immunophenotype. This is very important for tertiary cancer center or reference lab because most of the cases, we don't have the original immunophenotype. 
And thirdly, we can use a standard antibody panel rather than we have to use a list of in information antibody panel derived from diagnosis. We use the same antibody panel at diagnosis and at MRD detection. But difference from normal does require expert knowledge of patterns and antigen expression on normal progenitors. Um, the interpretation is inherently um, very subjective. It requires a high level of expertise and the training and the practice. So um, fullness cytometry, it has a moderate uh, sensitivity. If you use six to 10 color, you can push to 0.001 to 0.001%. It is a rapid testing, have a turnaround time one to two days and give you direct quantification of blast percentage out of all the white blood cells or nucleated cells. And it's generally applicable to almost all cases of AML and to all laboratories, because majority of the lab would have flow cytometer. But the major challenge is lack of standardization. There is um, considerable um, uh, interlaborate variations regarding the instrument, reagent, assay design, uh, data analysis and reporting causing lack of reproducibility. So we do need to develop standardized assay which allow the result comparison between laboratories and between treatment protocols and require high level of expertise. But overall, it's a good um, post-induction uh, MRD testing. You give the clinician result after one to two days and uh, they can make clinical decision according to your MRD results. Then RT-PCR based methods, um, this assay are developed in 1990s, which really provide a major step forward in establishing standardized approach for MRD detection in a wide range of leukemias, including lymphoblast leukemia. And in AML, they can be applied in cases with chimeric fusion genes caused by balanced translocation, such as um, 1517 and A21 and also can be used in the gene mutations such as NPM1, FLIS3, CBPF, or uh, KIT, and it can be used in gene overexpression, for example, WT1. Then what percentage of AML will have MRD targets by PCR? It based on age. Balanced chromosome rearrangement are present in about 25 to 40% of pediatric and younger patients and molecular mutations are present in 25% of adult patients. So overall, that would give you 6 to 70% of the AML have potential MRD targets by PCR-based methods. And is tenfold more sensitive than general flow cytometry? They use a standard prim primer probe sets. And the landmark in the standardization of this methodology for clinic implementation really from the European Against Cancer Program, who established a framework of assessment and uh, uh, standardization of RT-PCR. And they select the primer probe sets through systemic parallel evaluation in the international network of expert laboratories, and they help identify reliable internal controls, and they also facilitate the comparison of data among labs. So most of RT-PCR-based assay are extensively uh, standardized in Europe. And with the implementation of exome sequencing and uh, single nucleotide polymorphism assays, many previously unknown molecular aberrations have been discovered in AML, and their findings will expand the pool of potential targets by RT-PCR. So in summary, RT-PCR offers a more sensitive method than flow cytometry, it is, again, rapid, standardized, but they are limited to a subset of AML. Right now, it's 60 to 70%. It may expand uh, in the future. We cannot provide accurate quantification because the number of mutant transcripts probably varies between patients and can be altered after treatment. And uh, we cannot distinguish blast versus differentiated cells. Sometimes the mutant is detected, but you have no way to know whether the mutant is in the actual leukemic blast or differentiating cells. If they're only in differentiated cells, they might not have the same leukemogenic potential as if they present in the leukemic blasts. So all the um, scenario need to be taken into account when you um, apply this result to your clinical study. Then that comes the nearest uh, method, next generation sequencing. 
there are a number of different NGS platforms using different sequencing uh, technology. However, all the platforms perform a sequence of millions of small fragments of DNA in parallel, but you can have different platform. NGS can be used to sequence entire genome or constrained to a specific area of interest, and it could increase the sensitivity if uh, you only focus on a couple of genes. So NGS have been shown to detect MRD in NPM1 mutated AML. This um, test is developed in our laboratory led by uh, Steve and uh, David. They show that sensitivity is comparable or even more sensitive than flow cytometry, reach a 0.001% sensitivity. And the level of blast estimated by NGS technology is really comparable to flow cytometry based on 22 samples from six patients. And NGS can detect MRD in a subset of low negative cases because the immunophenotype of this particular type of AML can be tricky, especially in the regenerating marrow. They do not require knowledge of prior mutation subtype. Doesn't matter if it's type A, type B, type C, or type D. They use the same primer probe rather than use a mutation-specific probe if you use RT-PCR-based method. And besides, it can detect a subclone. I'll show you in this example two patients the index clone is type B mutation, but after treatment, you can see uh, a type A clone emerges. So imagine if you use RT-PCR-based methods and you use <coughs> type B specific primer probes, you're probably going to miss this um, type A clone. So sensitivity varies of NGS depending on the depth of sequencing, um, is able to be standardized and has potential for objective interpretation, but the turnaround time is long and is largely investigational at this time point. It doesn't have a lot of clinical trials to support the clinical significance using this method for MRD. Okay, I've talked about um, the methods. Why do we do MRD testing? So I want to ask, does MRD has clinical significance? If so, what time points are informative during the treatment or during the monitoring, what cutoff levels are informative? And the big question is, what methods should we use to detect MRD? There are two prospects of MRD determination. Prognostic significance. Can MRD predict outcome? Second is the role of MRD in risk-directed therapy. In other words, can MRD status improve risk stratification to guide further therapy. For example, in MRD-positive patients, we probably should give him more um, treatment, intensified regimen, or considering allotransplant or other novel therapies. But for MRD-negative patients, we probably can consider reduce the treatment intensity or remove the patient from therapy to avoid unnecessary side effect. So there are many, many studies down there looking at the correlation of MRD at various time points um, and the relation to the outcome. So this study evaluated MRD at an early time points, is day 16 to 18 post-induction. I want to add, mention at this time point, marrow is largely a plasia uh, in a, a plastic state. At day 21 is the marrow start to regenerate. So basically you're looking at an empty marrow. <clears throat> And the flow sensitivity at this stage is probably not very high unless it's a large proportion of abnormal blast. So they use flow cytometry to detect MRD and they use a cutoff 0.15% from the statistical analysis as a cutoff. And they find the presence of MRD at this early stage is associated with a shorter relapse-free survival and a shorter overall survival. And when they perform a multivariant analysis, including all the pretreatment variables, including age, status, performance status, WBC, and the cytal abnormalities, they find the MRD is the independent prognostic factors. When you account MRD, other factors doesn't matter. So this is our own study using our patient cohort and uh, using our in-house flow cytometry data. And here, MRD is defined as any level of detectable leukemic blast, and MRD negative is defined as no leukemic blast was identified. 
The time point is post-induction day 28 to 45 when patients achieve morphologic remission. The dates um, range varies sometimes because of the patients not here for the scheduled appointment or um, one patient achieve morphologic remission because that requires specific CBC recovery. So the range is kind of variable from four weeks to seven weeks. And we also find the presence of any level of MRD at this time point post-induction, the relapse-free survival is shorter, overall survival is shorter. So confirmed others result at early time points, um, similar findings. In addition, we also find complete peripheral blood cancer recovery is also associated with longer relapse-free survival and uh, um, overall survival. So when we put them into multivariate analysis, we found both MRD and complete blood count recovery are independent prognostic factors as the post-treatment parameters. And further studies show only patients without MRD and with a complete CBC recovery had distinctly favorable prognosis. And other groups, including complete count recovery but with MRD, or incomplete con recovery without MRD all have a similarly bad prognosis. So we may incorporate both this post-treatment parameters to predict outcome. Maybe we can have more accuracy to predict, predict relapse and other outcomes. What about MRD detected at a later time points? So similar to the early time points post-induction, MRD detected at later time points is also similar predictive of outcome. And this AML 10, 12, 13 trial combined look at 142 patients. They again use flow cytometry to detect MRD and using a 0.035% as a cutoff. And they find the presence of MRD is associated with a shorter relapse-free survival and a shorter um, overall survival and increased risk of relapse. So the data concordant no matter which time points you detect MRD is associated with a poor prognosis. Then what about the value of MRD in the setting of transplant? Um, this is the study done at our institution, again using our flow cytometry data. MRD again is defined as any level of detectable residual blast. So we find um, at any time points pre-transplant, MRD is present, is associated with a poor prognosis. And they further separate the MRD positive group into three different groups, uh, MRD level less than 0.1% from 0.1 to 1% and 1%. They all have similar outcome regardless of the level of MRD. In other words, as long as you have MRD detected pre-transplant, you have poor prognosis. Doesn't matter if it's 0.001 or 1%. The study further extends to include post-transplant uh, time points, and they find the combination of pre- and post-transplant MRD negativity correlates with a good outcome. So MRD positivity at any time points, pre uh, or post day 28 or CR1, CR2 or correlate with a poor prognosis. So not only in during the therapy, even in the transplant setting, um, transplant cannot overcome the MRD positivity, the bad influence. So just the summary of the clinical significance of MRD by flow cytometry, there are many studies support the notion that MRD is an independent prognostic factor for risk of relapse, relapse-free survival, and overall survival. So when you account for MRD, other pretreatment factors doesn't matter that much regarding the outcome. And for clinical relevant timing of MRD assessment, seems like from the data, we showed end of induction after first consolidation, pre and post transplant all have a poor prognosis. And cutoff values uh, vary from more than zero to well, 1%, but it doesn't matter that much because I show you in your one paper, the different MRD level does not have a difference in the outcome. They're all bad, any level of MRD is bad. And it's also related to treatment protocol and the rate of relapse. Response. So besides flow cytometry in the core binding factor AML, that means AML with balanced translocation, we use RT-PCR to measure MRD. Um, in this CBL 2016, 2006 trial, uh, MRD was measured 
before initiation of first, second, and third consolidation courses. And they found they used a three log reduction as the cutoff, and they find less than three log reduction of the first consolidation was a sole prognostic factor of relapse associated with um, increased rate of relapse and shorter survival. And again, with their multivariate analysis, other factor doesn't matter that much. And the limit of detection of this test, I believe, is 0 0.01 to 0.001%, 10 to the minus fourth to 10 to the minus fifth. In concordance with findings in core binding factor leukemia, MRD detected by PCR in NPM1 mutated AML can also identify patients with high risk of relapse. And they find uh, persistence of mutated NPM1 transcript in proof of blood following second induction was associated with an inferior outcome. And MRD in proof of blood seems more informative than positivity in marrows at any time points. And here they reported the detection limit is 0.01%. So this is negative defined as less than 0.01, positivity is defined as more than 0.01%. And a separate study published this year, they used the cutoff of a four log reduction. And they find if the patient MRD positive with a four log reduction in the proof of blood of the induction is associated with a higher incidence of relapse. And interestingly, they also find MRD positive, but with the four log reduction has a similar outcome with patients with MRD negative. So probably below certain point, MRD level doesn't matter and the kinetics actually kicked in and have more significant influence on the outcome. What could we do with this result? And uh, they try to use a transplant to see whether it can improve outcome. So the gray line is the four log, less than four log induction, the bad responder, but no transplant. The red line is the bad responder with transplant. So as you can see here, transplant significantly improved the disease-free survival and overall survival. It does do something if you use MRD into your risk stratification. However, this benefit was not seen in patients with greater than four log reduction. So if you are a good responder, even if you give a patient a transplant or other novel therapies, actually does not improve your outcome furthermore. So in summary for MRD by RTQ-PCR, it does provide a sensitive tool to detect MRD and is an independent prognostic factor showed in uh, core binding factor leukemia and NPM1 mutated leukemia. Peripheral blood seems more informative than marrow in some cases, some studies, and we hope MRD status could be incorporated into risk direct therapy to improve outcome as shown in several um, studies if they give transplant in bad responders with MRD, they can improve patient outcome. So there is some hope there. So for the newer technology, there's limited data, but the question I want to ask is, does MRD measured by NGS, the newer technique, have a clinical significance? There are really limited study and the patient cohort is small. For example, this study, they only looked at 50 paired diagnostic and day 30 remission sample. And uh, the um, sequencing coverage is 200 to 400 fold, so it's not really that sensitive. The VAV va variant allele frequency, the cutoff is less than 2.5%, which translates into the variant cell frequency of 5%. So they can be detected if you have 5% disease cell in your sample. Um, after day 30, of the 50 patients, 20, six has cleared mutation, no mutation detected, 24 patients at least have one persistent mutation. The mean is 4.5. And they find patients with persistent mutations after induction had a significantly reduced event-free survival of overall survival. Even with this sensitivity, um, with the cutoff of 2.5, they could still see a difference among outcomes. So there is some hope. And this study is just published. Um, they used a higher sensitivity target sequencing and is a 122 gene panel. And they will be able to uh, decrease the detection threshold at WAF 
and the cutoff is 0.4%. The patient cohort included 59 paired diagnostic and post-induction remission sample. And they find if the patient has more than three lesions detected, they have a significantly poorer prognosis than if with zero to two lesions detected. There's another figure in the paper showing a uh, patient with two lesions detected has a worse prognosis than patient with zero to one lesion detected, but the difference is not as dramatic as this one, so I use this one here. Anyway, even by NGS, we kind of can see some trend um, at remission time point, patients with more mutations have a poor prognosis compared to the one with clear the mutation. So there's only limited data showing prognostic value of clone-specific MRD evaluation by NGS, and we do need a large clinical trial to confirm the results and explore its role in risk stratification. And our lab have demonstrated feasibility using high sensitivity NGS for MRD in NPM1 positive AML. The sensitivity can down to 0.001%. We've been doing that for about two years, so we hope our data could shed light on the clinical significance of MRD by NGS. So now I have shown you um, a lot of clinical studies uh, with the evidence supporting the notion of prognostic significance of MRD. I hope I haven't lost too many of you. Now we'll talk about some practical issues um, currently exist with the uh, MRD testing. So what is the optimal methods for MRD assessment? For each of these three methods, flow cytometry, RT-PCR, and GS, I've listed disadvantages and advantages. Um, currently, flow cytometry is considered widely applicable to almost all leukemia and almost to all laboratories. And it has been validated in early risk stratification. And in the sequential MRD monitoring, there is no consensus. People haven't formed a consensus whether we should keep monitoring patients removed from therapy and in remission. So it seems like for the early time point, flow cytometry is the appropriate assay to choose. For RT-PCR, uh, fusion genes and NPM1 is applicable in about 30 to 62 percent. Now I think the um, range is from 50 to 70 percent. For the early risk stratification is marker dependent. Uh, for example, in the pediatric patients, A21 measured at early time point does not have a significant prognostic significance. But for the sequential MRD monitoring, it is validated in both NPM1 and the fusion gene transcripts. Uh, WT1 is not very specific, so I don't think a lot of lab using that as a MRD marker. Uh, NGS applicability in Technically or theoretically, it should be applied to majority of AML because it can almost always find some molecular mutations here and there, but is largely investigational, either in the early risk stratification or sequential MRD monitoring. But one point I want to make is because the promising preliminary data in NPM1 AML by NGS and because of the parent advantage of NGS, does not need the mutation-specific probes or prior knowledge of the prior mutation subtype, NGS will likely soon be applied to other um, informative, informative genes to monitor MRD, such as the MT3A, RANX1, IDH12, in a multiplexed assay. So we can choose a panel of um, gene mutation, and we can do them all at once with a reasonable sensitivity. And because this newer approach for MRD monitoring by NGS has the potential for improved assay standardization, and it may eventually replace other MRD technology or methodology in a certain type of um, AML. But right now it's largely imitational and has the disadvantage of high cost, slow turnaround time, and need for error correction strategies when PCR amplification is used. Other practical issues, we're hoping MRD could predict relapse, but sometimes we have discordant outcome. The clinical outcome is different from that predicted by MRD. For example, MRD negative patients still relapse in, even with more sensitive methods, still in 20% of cases, you see relapse in MRD negative patients. 
and that could be explained by leukemic blast present at the level below the limit of detection. So we probably need a more sensitive method in this sense. We can add more color to the flow cytometry to include um, in increased sensitivity, and we can do deeper sequencing for NGS. There is a need for more sensitive methods in this group of patients. And also leukemic blast may not be present in the sample tested. Um, there's data show PET scanning of marrow reviews marked spatial heterogeneity during and after therapy, indicating that response to therapy also varies considerably throughout the marrow. So you might not just hit the marrow part without any uh, leukemic cells. Then besides this, there's also MRD positive patients have longer survival, which is more perplexing. So possible explanations are MRD below certain threshold do not correlate with outcome, just like the NPM1 uh, AMI I showed you, if it's less than four log, more than four log reduction, even MRD positive doesn't make any difference. Or the time of assessment following therapy is too early when um, chemotherapy is still in effect. Also could due to MRD present in the mature cells without leukemogenic potential. So MRD is positive, but they're in the differentiating cells, so they won't cause leukemia in the long run. Or the patient have very effective immune surveillance, keep the residual blast in check. So all these factors need, need be taken into account when you um, considering use MRD results by different methods. So as we all know, um, AML is a heterogeneous disease. Um, they may contain multiple genetic and immunophenotypic subclones at the time of diagnosis or relapse. So what are the ideal markers for MRD detection? We want to find driver mutations that are required for maintenance of leukemic state, not as the um, age-related hematopoiesis like the nt 3 a ASX1, and type 2 you always find them even in the remission sample. And we also like to find immunophenotypic aberrations in the early leukemic stem cell population that contain the cell renewal property of leukemia, so they have more uh, stronger leukemogenic potential. So in that sense, novel methods are needed in uh, particularly uh, technique that allows direct observation of leukemic heterogeneity at a single cell level, including a leukemia cell population. In that way, we can improve both of our, our understanding of the biologic process and treatment response, and also for the purpose of assessment of relapse risk. So in summary, uh, what are our conclusions or about MRD? Does MRD have clinical significance? Yes, we have multiple studies show it is an independent predictor of outcome. So could we use MRD direct therapy to improve outcome? Likely, we have data showing using a transplant in the MRD positive patients greatly increase the, um, improve the outcome. What time points and cutoff levels are informative? This question asked depend on different protocols and methods. So post-induction, post-consolidation, pre-post-transplant, it seems like they all matter depending on the different methods you use. And it is highly method and protocol dependent. And what are the optimal methods to detect MRD? So for early assessment, we're looking for a method with moderate sensitivity, but relatively um, quick turnaround time so a clinician can use your result to determine his for the next step therapy. So flow cytometry and RT-PCR in that sense may be suitable. And um, higher sensitive assay is probably necessary to identify a subset of, a small subset of truly excellent responses. So we can remove these patients from therapy to avoid unnecessary side effect. And for the disease monitoring, we do want a highly sensitive method to avoid uh, false negative results so we can catch patients going to have a hematologic relapse at times so we can give the patient appropriate treatment. So in this sense, probably RTQPCR and high sensitivity NGS is more appropriate than flow cytometry based methods. A general strategy for MRD detection will require use of more than one technology. So based on the current situation, one size fit all is not feasible at present time because of all sorts of factors I just mentioned.
So what are the future for the MRD? So want to use MRD quantification to refine the risk stratification based largely on pre-treatment variables and apply them into MRD-directed therapy to eventually improve outcome. Thank you. Any questions? Um, you, you talked about standardizing assays between laboratories. And in chemistry, that's really hard to do. And I think, I think that's pretty simple. The things that you guys do is really complicated and really hard. How are you going to standardize the, ass the kinds of assays that you guys do from laboratory to laboratory? It's very difficult. Currently, um, COG just requires standardization among the laboratories the, for the BALL. Um, so what they did is they require laboratories to submit a um, certain amount of positive and negatives to the two big reference lab, our lab and a lab in John Hopkins, and we check their right or wrong. If they pass the test, they can have the, the same send the assay and the run on the patient sample. But for AML, I don't think that there's um, standardization going on, and I think it will be extremely difficult because instrument difficult, uh, a different regions different, and assay design is different, um, analysis is different, reporting is also different. But we're working toward that. I think is because flow cytometry is widely applicable given the AML and uh, the instrument availability is really um, readily uh, applicable technique, we should have a more way to standardize the assay. Are mutant DNAs more prevalent in cell-free material or in the cells? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Are mutant DNAs more prevalent in cell-free material or the cells? So if you pellet cells, where are the mutations? Which has a greater concentration? You mean in the circulating Peripheral cells? Peripheral blood. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in NPM1 testing, they find um, uh, DNA mutant present in peripheral blood is more informative than in the marrow. Seems like there is a higher rate of detecting positive in the marrow, but according to the clinical significance, um, mutant detected in the peripheral blood has more significant. Uh, in peripheral blood, am I looking at the whole blood or the cells or the cell-free DNA? It's with cells. I believe it's not cell-free DNA. It's is collecting it, on the white blood cells. But is it more prevalent in the cell-free DNA? as it is in many tumors. I'm not aware of that data collected. Hi. Uh, regarding the very good responders, has anybody looked at the genetic kind of like profile of the patients who really respond very well, or to kind of like these good responders maybe getting less treatment, especially in special age populations, like the younger populations? Has anybody looked at the good responders to see whether they have any genetic factors that you know we can screen I'm them not, for? Uh, I'm not aware the large clinical trials to look for that. Um, but I know just in general, um, age-related hematopoiesis, the clone is more prevalent in the older patients. In the younger patients, is the presence is really low. But I don't know whether people really look extensively the correlation of genetic profile versus the response. I have a basic question, but in the prognostic studies for MRD, mm -hmm. is it controlled for the therapy or is therapy escalated in the patients that have MRD in those studies? I think it usually is, um, they, they can choose a few different induction therapy, then they just treat the patients. Ideally, they should use the same regimen, but as far as I know, in our institution, the regimen is really not uniform. <laughs> So we just try to get much as we can get, just compare the MRD positive versus negative. I think a larger trials will have more standard regimen, but in the individual institution, I think it's really hard to get only one regimen than do the study. And the, the, the true good clinical trial should be really randomized to different therapy than look at MRD, but it's not very feasible in reality you have multiple trials going on, you always have problems for the patient's distribution, you can just get as much as you can. <laughs>
Any more questions? Thank you.